Hi, and welcome back to one more presentation. And uh, this is going to be a short presentation on credit derivatives. In this presentation, we're going to discuss about the credit default swap and its variant known as the basket credit default swap. We're also going to talk about the credit link node and I'm going to differentiate between the credit link node and the credit default swap. Other than that, uh, we are also going to discuss about the credit options, namely the put as well as call and the credit spread forward as well. Now, this lecture is specifically directed towards the FRN part two and the CFA level three candidates. So without much ado, let's first jump into understanding the credit default swap and to drive home the point, I'm going to start off with a small example, maybe somewhat related or unrelated. I leave the decision to you guys to understand. Okay, so imagine that we are talking about a house. Now, this home is insured, is owned by a gentleman, X. And since he owns this particular house, he also insures this house against any sort of damage that the house may suffer. So it could be natural calamity, for example, flood, Tempest, it could be accidents, for example, fire, earthquake included here, or it could be post breaking like that of burglary. Now, in either of these cases, either of these cases, the damage that the house may and your house may suffer would cause tremendous amount of emotional as well as financial loss. Hence, to avoid the financial loss or to be compensated for the financial loss, Mr. X is going to approach the insurance company. Mostly these are the monoline insurance companies or even the general insurance company, depending upon which geography and sovereign we are talking about that would study the underlying property out here, would conduct its own due diligence and will underwrite the risk that we just mentioned about. So against the risk that we mentioned, the insurance company will demand certain premium and depending upon the type of the contract itself, the insured, that is to say Mr. X may pay premium to the insurance company on an annual basis and renew the contract for one more year or Mr. X may pay a lump sum premium for let's say n number of years. Both options are available. Now in this situation, this insurance policy is valid in the eyes of law as well as the insurance, insurance regulator. And that is going to be uniform across any sovereign, any geography you can think of for a couple of reasons. The reason number one is Mr. X who owns this house is now deemed to have something called as insurable interest. Insurable interest. And second is that the policy of insurance has been taken out not with the view of profiteering from this policy, but use this policy only as a contingent payoff. Okay, which means that in the event nothing happens, which is the most likelihood, Mr. X will keep on paying the premium every year to this insurance company and the insurance company will not have to remit anything or will not have to pay anything back to Mr. X because the underlying risk for which Mr. X has taken out the insurance has not manifested. Well, this is a pure insurance contract. Now come to think of it that if by any means, against this particular house, let's say Mr. A and Mr. B and Mr. Z and Miss C, all four of them, in fact, you could 
add as many as possible, as many characters as possible. All of them individually takes out an insurance policy against this particular property. Okay. Now you would like to think that in the world of insurance, that is going to be impossible. Why? Because in both, in, in this particular case, neither of them owns this underlying property. That means that the first condition of insurance is violated. There is no insurable interest as far as A, B, Z, C are concerned over this particular property on which Mr. X has already taken out of the insurance. But in the wake of 2007-2009 financial crisis, it was found that a derivative called CDS or the credit default swap, which is essentially an insurance contract, played havoc and played one of the pivotal roles in facilitating the catastrophe. In such a market, in such a situation, what had happened was if I can brought that, if I can bring home the point, just to bring home the point, I will still continue with my example out here. That all of these, all of these individuals were allowed to take out the policy on a single property on which they did not have any ownership, hence they did not have any insurable interest. One would like to think that why somebody would do like that. Well, the only other option that is left that why somebody would take out an insurance policy despite not owning the home is when somebody wants to have or deems some speculative interest. Which obviously gives rise to profiteering motive. Since the law of insurance prohibits the insured to have any profiteering motive. Hence, a CDS cannot be truly termed an insurance contract because this could not have been allowed by any regulator of any known sovereign. Hence, in the disguise of derivative, this insurance com contract found its way in the capital market, wherein there were speculators who would take out this insurance policy against the particular asset which they did not have any ownership of. Obviously, you may understand that in such a situation, their only motive was to earn some profit out of the whole scenario. So much so that not only this a serious contract, which originated as an OTC contract, that means they were allowed to be underwritten between two willing parties. Later on, it was found that these OTC contracts were found some way it found their way by some means it found their way in the secondary capital market that means that these insurance contracts virtually were also trade a bill thus enhancing the speculative value of this insurance contracts now that is exactly what a cds is all about now let's revert to our presentation and understand now how the mechanics actually work All right. So the asset under consideration, we will designate that asset as reference asset and rightly so because as we have learned that in order to take out an insurance policy known as the CDS contract, it is not mandatory for the insured to have any ownership over the asset and hence we are going to call these assets as reference asset. But obvious that in the subprime market, these reference assets were credit sensitive assets. What does that mean? Well, essentially these assets were actually bonds. And more precisely, if we are allowed to improvise on them, these were types of MBS, the asset backed commercial paper, the collateralized debt obligation and any other structured finance which were typically bore, which typically bore some sort of interest 
preparing cash flow. So as you may understand that the MBS or the ABCP or the CDO, all of them are primarily fixed income securities. And with just like any other fixed income security, the biggest risk with them are the risk, biggest risk with them is the risk of default. Hence, the CDS contract were being taken out against these securities against any possible default. And we know for a fact in the hindsight that in the 2007-2009 financial subprime crisis, all of this instrument fell like pinball, lock, stock, and barrel. All of them defaulted, thereby increasing the value of this CDS contract all the all, all the more. Now let's understand that how the settlement happens. There are two ways that the settlement may happen. One is called the physical and another is the cash settlement. Before that, let me also apprise you that the protection buyer out here who is essentially a speculator, it is not necessarily, it is not necessarily that he has to own these assets and hence from that point of view, I'm terming them as speculators. Now these are speculators, would pay their periodic premium to this protection seller. In our case, we will assume this protection seller as the AIG, the world's largest insurance company, which was on the brink, which was on the brink of bankruptcy when, when Fed bailed it out by injecting $700 billion of taxpayers' money. And that money actually went in to settle the contractual obligation that AIG had with the Goldman Sachs and the JP Morgans of the world. Anyway, that's for another day. Let's understand the mechanism. So as with any insurance contract, the protection buyer will pay a periodic premium. And if nothing happens, the protection seller, that is the insurance company out here, gets to keep this premium intact. However, if there is any default as defined in the contract between the protection buyer and the protection seller, then the protection seller will have to make good of that loss. And as stated before, that the relationship out here need not necessarily be one is to one. That means the CDS contract would have been purchased by Anybody and everybody in the market, not necessarily the one who already owned the physical asset. The physical asset out here, are obviously, these credit sensitive bonds. Now, let's talk about the settlement. So whenever there is a default in the market, the defaulted security immediately plummets in value. However, it does not quite plunge to zero. So it may so happen that if the issuer has a default, if the issue has defaulted, the market may immediately value the security at $30 against a face value of 100. That means the loss given a default in our language is deemed at 70. So now in case of physical settlement, the protection buyer would purchase this security from the market, assuming that if these securities are not in the possession of the protection buyer beforehand. The protection buyer is required to buy or purchase the security from the market at $30 a piece, hand it over to the protection seller, and the protection seller is going to compensate for the full face value of 100 Another way of settling this is by merely paying $70, which is known as the loss given a default, wherein the protection seller is going to compensate for the loss the protection buyer has suffered. So these are the two ways the settlement would happen. Now let's talk about the default position for a while. The default could either be a binary event or multifaceted. What does that mean? So as you may understand that in our parlance of risk management, we define default into two categories. One is the hard default, and another is the technical default. Whereas the hard default would mean the issuer or the issue is now simply incapable of 
meeting the contractual obligation of paying coupon or even the face value. That's a hard default. Whereas on the other hand, the technical default may range from rating downgrade to restructuring of the issuer or even breach of certain covenants. Any of them, occurrence of any of them may trigger a technical default. Subject to the contract that has been inked between the protection buyer and the protection seller, as the case may manifest, as the default may manifest, the protection seller will have to compensate for the loss. So this is, in short, is a credit default swap. Now, coming to the variation of credit default swap, which I think is also important, is the basket credit default swap. In this case, I would have liked to define the credit default swap from single name asset, single named asset. Whereas in case of a basket credit default swap, we are essentially talking about a portfolio of fixed income securities. This portfolio of fixed income securities is going to comprise of several bonds or bond-like instruments all of them are going to differ from one another. Now in this situation, few things can happen. The way the credit default swap is going to be priced out here depends on several factors and all of them are essential for us to know and it could get very tricky as well. To begin with, we will assume a couple of things. One is that each of these bonds, let us designate them as B1, B2, B3, so on and so forth, this being Bn. So we will assume first that between these securities, pairwise, either there is no correlation or there is perfectly positive correlation. As you may understand that the consideration of negative correlation does not arise because that would simply mean that the risk on a portfolio basis is less. So we're going to assume a couple of ridiculous yet extreme example of these bonds bearing either zero correlation with each other to perfectly positive correlation. Let us also assume that each of these bonds have a marginal default probability of, let's say, 3%. Now, if we assume that all of them have a perfectly positive correlation, that would mean that all of these bonds will default at once or none will. In our case, if we assume that this portfolio comprises of, or this basket comprises of 10 such instruments, that would mean that with a perfectly positive correlation, the portfolio would default, the probability of the same is going to be 3%. That means at any given point in time, the portfolio's survival rate is going to be 97%. On the other hand, you may also understand that if the correlation is zero, then the probability that all of them are going to default at the same time is virtually zero because the defaults are going to be independent to each other. That means they are perfectly independently and identically distributed. And if we take out this distribution and if we try to project it over the portfolio, we're going to get a portfolio level default probability as somewhere 3% to the power 10. Of course, you may understand that this is going to be virtually zero. So this brings us to one important conclusion that having a perfect positive correlation would have a definite default probability as far as the portfolio is concerned, and that is essentially equal to any one bond defaulting. However, on the other hand, if there is no correlation, then all of them are going to default is virtually going to be zero. However, here one more twist is essential for us to understand that if I take that what is the probability that at least one is going to default, that probability is going to be significantly high as compared to the basket itself when the default correlation is one. 
have some free investments at your fingertips. Open free debit account now. Investments in security. for a while until you return he did Master AI tools as well. Secret number one is get certified in AI tools and chat GPT. Oh, that would be free notes for that. So we have 20 references, 5% probably default, and it's the first to default basket swap. It's If we, however, when the correlation is zero, the probability that at least one will default is significantly high as compared to the portfolio that comprises of securities bearing a correlation of one or close to one. How is it sold? So let's just work through the math a little bit. So in this case, the probability that one would default is 3% which means that the probability of survival of any given bond, let's say B1, is going to be one minus 3% or 97%. Now, if I were to find out that how many of them are actually good, what is the probability that at least one is going to default? So that is going to be the, the cumulative probability that all of the 10 bonds out here would survive and then taking a complement of the same. So how do we do that? So if we do this math, wherein all of them survive, this comes out to be somewhere close to 23%. Now watch this, what has happened. When the default correlation was one, the portfolio would default the probability of that was limited to 3% because of the positive correlation that these securities enjoy. However, when the correlation is a zero or close to zero, the probability that the basket would be triggered as far as the default is concerned is around 23% or eight times of that of the previous basket. Now, this brings us to one interesting aspect while pricing the CDS because the protection seller will have to take these two extreme circumstances into consideration. But that, that is not all. Most of the insurance contract or the CDS contracts are underwritten with one more caveat being the nth to default. Well, this nth to default would mean that in case of let's say the 10 bonds under consideration, if the first default, the contract between the protection buyer and the protection seller may be so inked that the protection buyer would not demand any compensation from the protection seller for the first default. However, 
if the second or the third bond defaults, the protection buyer at that point in time will trigger the compensation from the protection seller, would demand the compensation from the protection seller. It could be a partial compensation. That means in our consideration of 10 bonds out here in the portfolio, it could be so that the protection buyer may demand the loss on the entire first three bonds once the third bond defaults or the protection buyer may demand loss compensation on the whole basket. Primarily, this is called as nth to default. And now this nth to default is an important concept because that plays an important role as far as the pricing of the CDS contract is concerned. So we've got a couple of things in our fold here. First is that whenever we are talking about the basket credit default swap, the pricing is going to be complex in nature because it has to take into consideration two important aspects. The first being the characteristics of the constituent securities itself. Of course, depending upon what kind of correlation these securities enjoy in the basket, the portfolio or the pricing of the insurance contract against that is going to be suitably priced. Another is, of course, at which point in time the protection buyer may demand the loss. Is it the first to default or the nth to default? Accordingly, the CDS, pri CDS pricing would differ. All other things remaining constant. If it is first to default, obviously, in such a situation, those CDS contract is going to be pricier than when we are talking about, let's say, the third or the fourth or the nth to default. Because as we have understood that unless the correlation is perfectly positive, it is quite unlikely that contingent on the first couple of bonds defaulting, the fifth or the seventh bond would also default. Unless, of course, we have a perfect, positively, perfectly positive correlation. So these are two are major determinant, apart from, of course, the other aspects of the basket, that is the way, the, the rating of the overall basket, the weighted securities maturity, the, uh, the coupon thereof, and et cetera, et cetera. Other points are equally important. However, while pricing the CDS, these two form the cornerstone because we are talking about an insurance contract here. Okay, so from here, let's now shift our focus to another credit derivative, which is called the credit link node. Now, in this case, uh, what I'm going to do is, this is a little wordy, but nonetheless, I will read you out the text first. So first of all, a credit link node is part of the structured findings. And second is that this again is uh, somewhat of an insurance contract. However, the protection buyer out here is the bond issuer and not the bond owner. That is the first primary difference between the CLN and the CDS. Second is a CLN is deemed as a fully funded structure. Whereas the CDS is more of a naked contract. What does that mean? We will come to it a little later on. So let's first get through with the text out here. A credit link known is a fully funded insurance contract that is guised as derivative. It is contingent on the credit event. As we have known, the credit event could either be uh, a technical default or a harder default. The protection sellers are the notes holder while the protection buyer is the notes originator or the notes issuer. So this is the primary difference between a CDS contract and the CLN contract, because in case of a CDS contract, we deem that the protection buyer either already owns those securities in, the, in their fold or have a speculative position on those underlying security. But in case of a credit link node, the table simply turns here, here, 
the protection buyers are the ones who have actually issued the notes in the first place. So where is the catch? So let's understand. Uh, investors would buy the repackaged notes from the underwriter upfront fully funded, and that is the reason that they are called a fully funded CLN. In addition, they would provide the additional guarantee to bail out the prime lender in case of a credit event against a premium resulting in additional yield. Okay, so let's understand things into better, in, in a somewhat better perspective. So to begin with, I'm going to assume that we have, we are talking about a structured security. When we have the pool of borrowers out here and taking these loans as collateral, the prime lenders or the originator would issue securities in the market. Whereas the investors are going to invest in those securities, the backing of which is the borrower's pool. Now, mind you, here the borrower pool need not only be MBS, it could be any other security, essentially credit sensitive security, as we have, may have studied earlier. Now, in this case, if there is a credit event, let's understand what happens. The investors would first purchase the security from the notes originator. The notes originator would have the collateral as their backing. And at the same time, the notes originator, let's say the spool of borrowers has a weighted average yield of around, let's say, 10%. Based on this 10%, the prime lender or the notes originator out here may actually issue security to the investors out here bearing a coupon of, let's say, 10.5%. Now, this is not an exact match, I know, but you may understand the point which I'm trying to dive home. The, the catch being that these investors would enjoy the additional yield with the understanding that if there is a default out here, the notes originator will withhold all the future cash flows that would otherwise accrue to the investors. That means that the future coupons, even to the extent of the face value, may be withheld in order to recover the loss that the notes originator out here may have suffered because of these reference assets. Now, mind you, as I said before, that these reference assets are actually built or actually underwritten on this, on this pool of borrowers. So that is where we call this a fully funded structure because in this case, the prime lender out here or the notes originator bears no counterparty risk. Why? Because the investors already purchased these securities that the notes originators have issued in the market. That means they have already paid for those securities. The means of loss compensation is merely withholding the future cash flows that these investors otherwise are entitled to. The reason that they would agree to such an arrangement is because of the additional yield that the investors are enjoying out here. So this is the primary difference. Now I want all of you to pay special attention to this construct that I've created in order to drive home the point. And maybe you should make note of this difference between CDS contract and that of a CLN contract. A CDS is a naked insurance contract, while the CLN is a fully funded contract. Uh, CDS could be speculative without any insurable interest. It is unfunded, and sometimes the CDS contracts, if it is trading in the capital market, will necessarily also be marked to market on a daily basis, whereas the CLN are primarily an OTC contract which have got zero exposure as far as the capital markets are concerned. So I hope this small illustration was good enough for you to understand the primary difference between the CDS and the CLN. Now, let's also talk about a couple of more derivatives, starting with the options. Uh, we have a couple of options here. One is the credit spread put, and another is the credit spread hold. 
Now, let's first talk about the credit spread. Now, as you may know, the credit spread is nothing but the yield difference. Well, primarily the yield difference. Of course, there are other components to this yield difference. So the yield difference between the benchmark security, more often than not, which is a treasury security, and that of the corporate issue. Okay, so to begin with, if we understand that there is a issue in the market for the next 10 years, and we have the treasury yielding for a 10 year treasury is yielding, let's say 5%. The corporate may be yielding 7%. We designate this 2%, or let's say roughly 2%, majority portion of the 2%, attribute the same to the credit spread differential between this corporate issue and that of the treasury security. Of course, it's easy to understand why is it going to be so. But as we move along the line, in the time scale, of course, things may not remain constant. So the things, it could so happen that either the spread, and I'm taking a simplistic example out here, either the spread may actually widen in which case this 5% may remain at 5% or let's say it goes to 6%, doesn't, matter, doesn't quite really matter. It, let's say it remains at 5%. However, because of the, uh, because of the issuer's own internal problem, the yield on the corporate issue may jump by another 100 basis points to 8%. So that is where the credit spread has widened. We say that the credit spread has widened out here. And in this case, the widening has been to the tune of 1%. Now, you may understand that in such a scenario, of course, the holder of this issue is going to suffer some loss. So depending upon what the credit spread, how much the credit spread has uh, widened, depending upon the SEN, if we have to compute the loss, it could be designated as the notional principle. More often than not, we're going to replace the notional principle with the face value multiplied by the duration of the security under consideration multiplied by the credit spread difference. In our case, this credit spread difference is going to be 1%, 8% minus 7%. All right, so the such a such an instrument that that's available in the market is designate, designated as the credit spread put. On the other hand, there could be speculators in the market as well who may bet on certain assets credit quality improving over a period of time. And if the credit quality improves, of course, you may naturally understand that the bond's market value will also appreciate in tandem. In such a situation, we say that the security under consideration has experienced narrowing of credit spread. So in that case, the gain will have to be compensated or the, the gain will have to be suitably encashed by the same principle, only the tables turned here, wherein we say, that now, instead of the credit spread being 8%, the, the spread which was earlier 2%, now it has improved by 1%. All right. So this is the whole and soul of how a credit spread truth and a credit spread call is actually being priced. The basic math is very simple. There isn't much. You just need to understand the notional principle or the face value being given. Multiply the same with the duration of the security of the asset under consideration and multiplied by the credit spread difference. Now, you may understand that the credit spread difference initially out here at time t is equal to zero, the credit spread difference was, in our case, was 2%, which further got widened to 3%, thereby the CS1 minus CS0 being 3 minus 2. 
or 1%. So that's the loss that an investor would suffer whenever the credit spread widens. And hence, he naturally buys a put option to compensate for the loss. On the other hand, there would be speculators in the market who may think that the same issue under consideration, if it does actually improves in value because of some internal good thing happening with the issuer, the credit spread may actually narrow. And the earlier credit spread, which was around, let's say, 2% is now narrowed to 1%. So in this case, the call option payoff is going to be calculated basis CS0 minus CS1. I'm sorry, this is 2%, right? So 2 minus 1%. So in case the corporate issue starts yielding at 6%, so we will have the spread narrowing to 1%. On the other hand, the credit spread forward is where you would have, be, have been given the strike price already, which is uh, very similar. Uh, the strike price is, in, in this case, is going to be very similar to the initial credit spread, which is going to be designated as CS0. And then the rest of the math is exactly going to be similar as in this case. So I hope that this small presentation on credit derivatives were elucidating, and I hope that the FRM part two and the CFL level three candidates would benefit out of this whole illustration. Thank you so much, and see you next time.